churning waters send Coast Guard rescue crews barreling across the sea when a fishing vessel calls for help. Holy crap. Hey, they just got knocked down. My heart sank. Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. Air Station Astoria scans the water for clues on the search for a missing kayaker. The person had already been in the water 20 minutes, so concerns about the victim being hypothermic were certainly going through our minds. There's something right there, Alpha no And a training flight takes a sharp twist when the crew gets a call to save a fisherman with severe head injuries. Just make sure he's breathing, he's irresponsive. When I heard that distress call, my heart just automatically just started pumping. There is a HF antenna that's sticking pretty high up there. Yeah, I see that. We're ready for you. Just lost a whole bunch of their gear off the side, sir. High peaks and tumultuous waters make Cape Disappointment and the Pacific Northwest one of the most hazardous environments in North America. At the heart of it all is the Columbia River Bar. This deadly area has taken countless vessels and claimed hundreds of lives. In the air and on the sea, brave men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their own safety so that others may live. In a place known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. All stations, this is the United States Coast Guard Sector Columbia River. At 2.36 local time, the Coast Guard has received a report of an overturned kayak with 01 male within McNary Lake. Any vessel transiting the area is requested to keep a sharp lookout, assist if possible, and make any reports to this Coast Guard unit. The SAR alarm just went off, and we got a report of a kayak with two people in the water. So apparently, the Sheriff's Department called us and asked for assistance. One kayaker was on the shore with the sheriffs, and the other one was still in the water. And so we set out as quick as we could to go find him. Go ahead, down to that lake. We'll both get in there as quickly as we can and see if we can bring the poor guy back. Roger. The person had already been in the water 20 minutes before we'd even launched. Um, so concerns about the victim being hypothermic were uh, certainly going through our minds. We were wanting to get out there in a hurry and see, hopefully find a person there in the water. Three five sector, the ground party does not have visual on the person. The person is unaccounted for. It is a white male adult in his 40s. He was wearing a black jacket, black jeans, no life jacket. Been in the water for approximately 60 real minutes. Roger. That lake is right off of the river. Come around to the right. Roger, coming right. Doctor from Coast Guard 6035. Coming around three. We'll give you the shoreline search initially. They will search the uh, center point. Three, five, sector, roger. So we'll keep it nice and slow. We'll try to be thorough coming up the shoreline here. Roger. This is right by where they flipped. The area is fairly small. So at first we started off at the perimeter of the lake, making the assumption that the person was trying to make it inshore, maybe didn't quite make it. There's something right there off the nose, you see that? It's a log. Chris was on the infrared camera trying to look for any heat signatures on the shoreline. We were all looking out the same side of the aircraft circling around the, the entire lake while the police were there on foot on the outside and on the ground. They had said that he was wearing a black jacket and jeans, so there wasn't much color that was really going to stand out, but basically just looking for anything on the surface of the water and anything moving on the sides, what we were really looking for. All right, I'm going to go over to the other side, and we'll do the same thing one more time on the other side. Maybe you should check that little island piece there, too, pretty good, huh? Yeah, amongst the trees, I'd recommend it. There's something here. Yeah, nothing. It's kind of difficult to look through the trees and see if maybe he's there, trying to stay warm if he had already got out of the water. All right, well, we searched all the shoreline, unless I missed something, guys. I think I'm going to circle that little strip of land here in the center. Definitely. One of the bad parts with the water being so murky is that we just really can't penetrate below the surface. A lot of times we can look just a few feet below, maybe figure out some shadowing that's going on underwater, maybe have an idea where somebody might be. But that water was so brown and so dark, 
there was really no way of seeing anything beyond the first inch or two of the surface. Every time I've looked for somebody in the water, we end up finding the person pretty much where the boat was. Pretty much right where he was last seen, yeah. Yep. So maybe you can just hover there and stir up the water. One of the really effective tools that we have with the helicopter is the effects of the rotor wash. So I'm assuming they tied off that life jacket right there at the point where it sank. Whatever that black thing is over here on the right-hand side, you see that? I mean, it looks like fabric to me. We basically used the rotor wash just to kind of push on something to see what it did, how it moved, so we could kind of get a better picture of what it was. Now, see how something on the end of it, you can kind of it. Oh, there you go. It's going to change its shape. There you go, yeah. It's fabric of some sort. Yeah. Let's get these guys over here to check that out. OSP, Coast Guard Helicopter 6035. Right next to where the life jacket is, there appears to be some sort of black material in the water. Copy. There's a life jacket and a black coat. We left it out there as a marking. Roger. Now we got the slough over here to the left. And for us to say we've saturated it, we probably should see the slough in a little inlet. OK, we'll check it. We take every search and rescue case just as seriously as if we're going out to find one of our family members. And we were able to cover the entire lake about three times and thoroughly searched it like if we were looking for one of our our parents, our kids. Oh, uh, it's like a beer can or something, and then right next to it. Oh, it's a duck. It's a decoy duck. Yeah, duck decoy. Chris, what are you thinking right now? I think we've searched everything we're going to search. I don't think there's an alive person here. Therefore, I think other assets are going to be great. Come find that. Roger that. How about you, Blair? What do you got? Yeah, I'm kind of feeling the same. I don't know how far out further we want to go. Uh, Chris Carter, what do you think? If there was a person who could actually assist right now, we would have seen him in this small area already. Yeah. What do you think, sir? No, I'm with you guys. You know, I wish we could do more. I'm just hoping somebody has uh, got a better idea. You said I wish there's more we could do. I mean, we've done everything on our capability. It's just now they need a diver or something to look under the surface. That was a uh, body search foreclosure. Everybody's like, you know what? I feel very confident that we've looked at this entire lake very thoroughly and, uh, you know, it, it's time to uh, go back to the air station and uh, we knew there was other ground parties out there that were continuing to look, but we felt certain that that person was uh, either not in the lake at all or was, or had drowned somewhere and was just not found yet. Let's just fly this up one more time. Yeah. We'll close. That's Sector Coast Guard Helicopter 6035. We have heavily saturated the area at this point. Uh, we have covered uh, the entire lake probably a total of three times now. High confidence that uh, there's not a survivor uh, in the trees or along the shoreline or certainly not in the water. Good job. You guys are uh, free to RTV. 6035, uh, roger that. Thank you. The people in the kayak did not have life vests on. Typically, if a person has a life vest, we have a really good outcome. And if they don't have a life vest, normally we have a hard time finding them alive. Yeah, you just hate leaving for the sake of the family, though. Oh, uh, yeah, I know it sucks, you know, but it was my mom. That's what I was trying to think of. What yeah. would I do? Just like we said, I don't think as much as we can do from here. Not to the body warms up boat. When you sign up for this job, a certain part of you just wants to help no matter what. And when you go out to help somebody and you put that much effort and that much of your time and energy and just a part of you into that, it's tough to return without the person you were looking for. It takes a lot out of you. We would take this job very seriously, and we always hope for the best outcome. You ready for transition four yeah. flight back, gentlemen? You can go ahead and close the door. All right, come close. Got a report of fishing vessel Sylvia is taking on water 25 miles offshore. Do they have the flooding control? Negative, I'm unable to keep up with the flooding. Stern's clear. All right, rig the deck for gear pass. It's going to be a drogue. I want the drogue in the 200 feet of line. We tow across the bar on a flat day. We could do that in our sleep. When you change it up and you have to go get somebody in heavy weather, everything changes. It's like night and day. There's no relaxing. You're always stressed out. You're constantly calling out a wave. 
more people get sick underway. Six o'clock, moderate strength. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Heavy weather training, it brings in a piece of reality. You start to understand what's going to affect you, the seasickness, the movement of the bow, the wind. Send it! Even 10 knots of wind is going to affect everything you do. Cape Disappointment is an area known for rough weather, fast currents, high winds, and without constant training, we're not going to be ready. They're constantly being evaluated so that when we do get the big case in the middle of the night, when it's blowing sideways and dark and you're not feeling well, they're going to be able to complete the mission and get everybody home safe. Mayday, Mayday. This is FB Sylvia. Over. Roger, Captain. What's the nature of your stress? I've taken on water. I'm not sure where exactly from. My build pump isn't able to keep up. Roger that, Captain. We're in the process of getting a motor lifeboat underway right now. Six foot at nine seconds. Which at least is point five knots. They're grabbing a second P6 pump right now. Got a report of fishing vessel Sylvia is taking on water. Uh, initial call was 25 miles offshore. Stand by two. We have four. Four three. Getting underway for a fishing vessel, taking on water, uh, a bit more urgent for a case that's further offshore. It might be people in 40 to 50 degree water. It can get pretty chilly if they don't have their survival suits on. Uh, driving out to a 60 foot boat, four people on board. It's a wonderful northwest day. Raining, blowing. The call sounded pretty panicked, so we try to get a heel up just in case they sank pretty quick. Sylvia from Station Equina Bay. Our heel is looking at a 15 minute ETA. Over. Roger, thank you, sir. Uh, two fours, uh, 266. ETA, one hour, 45 minutes. 524, copy, thanks. Conditions are pretty rough, blowing probably 25 to 30 miles an hour. That's going to make the seas pretty choppy, so it's not going to be a fun ride going basically directly into it. taking on water, it's pretty urgent. I'm working the radio and making communications with the station and the boat and the, the helicopter that's out there. Pretty crappy ride. A combined sea was a little bigger than we were anticipating. Woo! Oh yeah, to my face. Getting pelted in the face by the rain repeatedly is a uh, is torturous. Ah. Just kind of keep your head down and try to see where you're going. trying to get there as fast as we can. With the wind blowing and uh, the sea spray, basically, you just got to turn your head and take the water or see where you're going again and keep trucking. There they are. There they are. Yeah, we got a visual. 2466. Got a visual on a vessel with their sodiums on. 666 on scene. Uh, winds are east, about 20 knots. Sylvia, this is a Coast Guard helicopter. We're going to depart. Uh, you are in good hands. Thank you very much. We got there. It's still a little bit of daylight. The helos are already turning around to fly back. A risk first gain for them. It wasn't you know, worth the risk to do anything else. Mr. Vessel Sylvia, this is the 266. How are your uh, pumps keeping up so far? Just keep it up. I'm not getting it. And it's not getting it. Roger, Captain. If you want, we can go ahead and send over uh, one more pump. All right, go get the pump ready. All right. All right, Captain, if you could uh, come down, we'll uh, get a position to toss it over. Stand by. All right. 
trying to work the deck, it's pretty hard. We're rocking and rolling. Now we're trying to get the pump across to, to the boat. Starboard side. All right, ready. Passing the heave line over, certainly having much stronger winds impacts your, your throw. Stand it up, hands up. Hold on to the ball. They're filling it in. Send it. Pump over, boy. The hell of a throw. Halfway. Made on the first shot. Was pretty happy about that, especially given the wind and sea state. We just sent over a P6 pump. Right now, we're holding right next to them while they uh, set it up. The swell's picked up a bit now that we've gotten offshore. Maybe a six foot swell every once in a while. Station 266. Send it by to see if they get our pump started. Send over a P6 pump. Right now, we're holding right next to them while they uh, set it up. Got a report of fishing vessel Sylvia is taking on water 25 miles offshore. 22.6 miles. This is going to be a All long right. drive home. Yeah. Now we got pumps on the boat. We're started the dewatering process. So we got a long way to go. It's going to be a real slow ride. Have you ever seen a boat with a lot of water in it? What happens is all that water goes to one side, and, and that boat will roll up and sit there, and then it'll all go back, and then it'll just go over. Super, super dangerous. <laughs> Still have your 6-6, six, six, go ahead. They said they burnt out the pump? That's what it sounds like. As we come within about 15 miles of the entrance buoy, the vessel's taking on water at a faster rate. Their pumps are not able to keep up with it. They're not able to use the pump that we have given them. OK, plan is you're going to go over there and assess the water on the boat. If you need another pump, we'll send you another pump. The boats are going to be rocking and rolling, so I'm going to get you up alongside close enough so you can get over there. And it becomes necessary that we have to jump onto the other vessel and get that pump going. There we go. You got to bring the throttle up slowly or it kicks out. Oh, okay. We got on board of the Sylvia, and they were glad to see us. We kind of brought a calming over the boat, I think. This is just the hold, right? Oh, yeah, this is just the fish hold. Yeah. yeah. All right, you want it down there now? I was going to keep a good eye on that boat while we got our guys over here to take care of our people. Hi. Sylvia 66. We'll keep on this course for a minute, see how the flooding goes. At some point, we'll have to make another course change to see you start making our way back toward the entrance buoy there. Roger. It's just the absolute worst course to steer, especially with uh, you know water in the boat. We gotta get these guys to go north. Give me a course. With the swell direction, how it was, and how unstable that boat was, the wrong course could have potentially rolled that boat over. So this 266, uh, what do you think about heading uh, directly into it? Do you think that would make a better ride, maybe a little more stable? Yeah, I think so. So we got to pick the right course just to get back to the entrance. Find the entrance, boy? Yeah, it's right by the, that lighthouse. It's like just to the left of it. All right. I want you to keep an eye on that for me. We're so close. Four and a half miles. This is where it's going to get tricky. We're getting pretty close to uh, home now, but it's, we're not really out of the woods yet. We got to get across the bar. Sylvia, what are your thoughts on uh, crossing the bar? I'm not stoked on it. This is my fourth trip. I just be, be mad bad. I got water in my build. Where, where do you think that? I think as far as the bar goes, it'll probably be pretty much what we see here. Yeah, Roger. Super, super dangerous. Crossing the bar. Any minute, a set of waves can come in, and next thing you know, the boat capsizes. Sylvia, this uh, is 6'6". How are we doing? Good. Roger. We're just a couple hundred yards from uh, getting between the tips here. Roger. As we cross the entrance, waves die down. It becomes flat. We're assessing where to tie the vessel up and while we are now keeping up with the flooding it's still flooding and there are still holes somewhere along the bottom of the boat later on they'll have divers go down below underneath the vessel and patch it up Sylvia we'll have some people at the dock to open lines 
This was a really long case. We uh, did about four knots from 25 miles out. Roger, we'll be tying up at Fort Dock 3. We escort them all the way in, and we're talking about where we can get them tied up so they can uh, continue their dewatering efforts. Certainly have a lot of respect for fishermen. They're going out for multiple days at a time. They're working extremely long hours with little sleep. It's nice to know that we're able to assist them if they ever start to have any troubles out of sea. Shirley R, rescue helicopter. Just like to find out if your crew member is still having seizures, over. We were on a training flight and received a call that uh, the fishing vessel Shirley R had a crew member that had struck his head and went into seizures. There is a HF antenna that's sticking pretty high up there. Yeah, I see that. It's probably about 60 feet. Be easy forward, right? He just lost a whole bunch of their gear off the side, sir. Vessel brief first, and then we'll do the hoist. Roger. I got them in We're currently over the mouth of the Columbia River training with Station Cape Disappointment. I haven't hoisted at night uh, since December, so I'm really excited to go out and just kind of knock some of the rest off and get that done. Ready out for one uh, trail line delivery to basket recovery to the 47 footer underway. Pon pon, pon pon, pon pon. All stations, all stations, all stations. United States Coast Guard sector Puget Sound. It was about 15 minutes before sunset. We were about to begin hoist training when we heard that we would possibly need to execute a medevac. So there's a boat 20 miles off Grays Harbor. Someone fell and, and hit their head, and they are in a seizure. Roger. So they are diverting us there now. Roger. And Commander, if you could turn north and make the best speed. Immediately upon notification of the SAR case, the crew came up with a plan we had a rescue swimmer on board. It was his first case, Brian Rodriguez. So he was also involved from the medical aspect. I'm going to call Station Grays Harbor and see what they can tell us. Brian, what sort of questions do you have about the seizure? First thing I want to make sure is, is he breathing? Just make sure he's breathing. Is he responsive? And after that, how long the seizures were? When I heard that distress call, I was just like, whoa. And you know, all my heart just automatically just started pumping. I was just thinking of what could I do. All these questions started running through my head. Was he able to talk? You know, was he laying down? Was he standing up? Could he walk? Okay, there's a target uh, about at 2 o'clock, looks like. Potentially our guy. Fishing vessel Shirley R. Fishing vessel Shirley R. This is the Coast Guard Rescue Helicopter 6029, channel 22, over. Shirley R. Good evening, Captain. We have you on radar, and uh, we should be there shortly. As we're getting on scene, it's what we call pinky time, nautical twilight, when the, the sun is below the horizon, but it's still that, that dusk sort of uh, condition. So we're looking at things becoming more difficult as it's dark, just because you have less visual reference, and you can't pick up your drift and movement. It has to be this guy off the nose. Surely are rescue helicopter. Just like to find out if your uh, if your crew member is still having seizures. Over. No, I would say he's out of the seizure, uh, but he doesn't know what happened. Okay. If the person can walk and get in the basket, obviously that's pretty straightforward. If there's any uh, neck injury, spine injury, or the person can't walk, then we would need to put a rescue swimmer down and employ a litter for the the person to be strapped down. Can you give us any information on spinal injuries or neck injuries? Can the person walk to a basket? He said that all his muscles are fine. He is mobile. And uh, the other two guys can assist if you need it. OK, so that's great information. Uh, stand by one. OK, Brian, with that updated information, what do you think? If the guy's walking around, throw him in the basket. The only thing I'm wary of is if this guy did have a seizure. Like, being hoisted is pretty dramatic. It's my fear that the guy's going to have a seizure while he's being hoisted. But I think that litter's best, but Brian should definitely make the decision, sir. OK. Brian, what are your thoughts? 
I think I would feel more comfortable just getting down. And, uh, but I'll check on him, make sure if he's good, and I'll just send out the basket. Okay. Our goal with the first voice was to put Brian down on the back deck of the boat so he could evaluate that patient and figure out exactly what kind of uh, device we needed to pick him up. Check the swimmer. Roger, check the swimmer. Cheerleader from the Coast Guard helicopter, we're going to make an approach to the stern of your vessel. We're ready for you. Sitting at that door, you know, I was like, this is not training anymore. This is legit. And I was just thinking to myself, slow, smooth, smooth as fast, you know. There is a HF antenna that's sticking pretty high up there. Yeah, I see that. It's probably about 60 feet. It should be out of the rotor disc, but if you want to do a little bit higher of a hoist, maybe like a... 60 foot hoist? 60 foot would probably be good, sir. Okay. Okay, target is at 2 o'clock. You can begin the hoist. Well, we're just going down. Easy forward, right? You just lost a whole bunch of their gear off the side, sir. Bummer. Sorry, about 10 feet off the back next to the vessel. Hold. Easy forward. I got on the boat. It was a smooth delivery, disconnected, and I made my way to the wheelhouse. I made contact with the survivor, and uh, the main thing I was looking for is just that he was aware. I checked the survivor's breathing. I checked his pulse. I also was making sure he was able to move. He didn't damage any part of his cervical collar. He said he tripped over, hit his head, and had a big laceration to the left side of his of his head. They had a, a way to stop the bleeding, but it wasn't really that sterile. It looked like it was a, a rag or a sock. I couldn't really tell. Surge ready for pickup. Prepare to take load, take load, fast and clear the vessel. Easy back left. Trail line still on deck, bank tended. That's halfway up. Pass is coming inside, Kevin. Pass forward. is going right in between you guys. Do you want to just set it back down for Brian? Roger, sir. We decided that at that point we should just disconnect the hoist hook from the basket, send it straight back down without briefing, uh, which expedited our pickup of Brian. The patient did have a head injury, could possibly have a concussion. He was seizing, and we wanted to expedite getting Brian to him just in case anything happened in the back of the plane because if I'm in the middle of a hoist and something happens to him, I can't help him because I have to worry about my swimmer. Door's going up. Door's just blows down. While I was being hoisted up, I just kept thinking, you know, I got to get up there and just continue on treating him, making sure he's stable. How's he doing back there? Giving him all two right now. He has a severe laceration to the left side of his uh his head, so he felt pretty hard. While I removed the gauze, I seen a large laceration to the left side of his head. It looked big, like he's gonna need some stitches on there, and um, I just try to keep it clean. Brian, a three bandage the guy's head. They were using a, a sock to stop the bleeding. Okay, we'll be on deck in two minutes. Brian replaced the bandage on the injured crew member. He was bleeding profusely from the head, uh, but was able to stabilize him, and he seemed to be in good condition as we transited. And crew report ready for approach. Ready for approach. When we landed at Hokum Airport, I grabbed the survivor and uh, escorted him to EMS, and he said, thank you, you know, thank you for helping me out which is a pretty awesome feeling, you know, to help somebody out. Man, I'm so glad I'm not a fisherman. I concur. My name is James Todd Mayo. I'm a fisherman from the Shirley R. We were out there halibut fishing 48 hours straight. I'm on one side baiting hooks. My whole left side seized up. I fell, cracked my head, and then I blacked out. My boys that I work with, my crew members, wrapped my head, and then that's when they called up the Coast Guard. 
they did an exceptional job. It was kind of, it was exhilarating. In the Pacific Northwest, when you're out there on the ocean, the only thing that you got going for yourself is the Coast Guard. They really look out for not just me, not just anyone, but everyone. Today, my biggest concerns are the boat coming in. It's not designed to operate in, in big seas. It's not designed to operate in breaking waves like our boats are. Oh, Jesus. Here it comes. He's going to take it. conditions and uh, we think it may be favorable for him to sneak inside before the ebb kicks in and keeps him stuck offshore That's overnight. It. Look at that. Wow. Right now we have two motor lifeboats, a uh, 52 foot motor lifeboat Victory back there and uh, we're the 47268. Victory will push outside and, and escort the vessel in behind them. We'll remain inside the tips, hold the position center channel to give the boat something to steer on. We get the call from the fishing vessel, Sylvia, that his intentions are to come across the Aquina Bay bar. It's the same vessel that pretty recently we helped assist when she was taken on water. It was just around high tide, which means that we would expect that the ebb would start. With the force of the water running out through the river, meeting the power coming in from the Pacific Ocean, generally uh, creates your worst conditions that you experience. So, yeah, looks like this is the series. Today, I'll be on the Motor Life Boat 47268, and I am the surfman of that boat. A surfman is the highest qualification that you can achieve as a small boat boat driver. It means that the command and the people around you have confidence that you can make good decisions while driving a boat. You can also drive the boats to its limitations. When we have these really big days or when we have these 18 to 20 foot seas, I always get a little butterflies. It's a mix between excitement and nervousness. Today, my biggest concerns are the boat coming in. It's not designed to operate in, in big seas. It's not designed to operate in, in breaking waves like our boats are. Port side. I got it. Right. Thank you. Woo! Good job. Coming in on the bow. Asia, you got the stern. That's going to be big. 25 yards. All right. That coming in is feathering. Woo! The conditions are crappy. Uh, about 12 to 14 foot seas. You know, we're sitting in there, we're bobbing, and we're taking a few breaks coming in through the channels. And that's another thing that we do. We aid in breaking down those waves, you know. If the boat comes at the tips, you know, we can turn around and break down that wave so that that boat can make it in without, you know, flopping to one of the jetties or the side. So, you know, kind of like a bodyguard. We just kind of sit in the middle of the channel. We, we guard the body of water for the boat to come in. That is big. Oh, ho, ho. there they go. You got a up here, just rolled underneath you. All right. Dude, that break was a mile wide. Dude, it was yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> that was a big break. We got on scene. Right as we got there, this big series rolls through. Um, probably 14 to 16 foot. We stopped right at the jetty tips. We had two boats on scene, so my job was to stay inside the jetty tips, and if something happened, I could go out. Also, I was going to stay center channel. That way, the fishing vessel had something to steer on. Sometimes the wave picks them up and puts them down. It's hard to see the range and the jetties in the bigger swells, but you can see the top of our antenna and things like that. Yeah, victory, Sylvia. Giving these last couple sets, the wind blinds. It's not time. Look at that. Look at that. No, it's not time. High side, high side starboard. Yeah, I see. 
The conditions at the time were 16 and 18 foot. Long rolling swell, occasional break across the jetty tips. We made the determination that before the Sylvia came in, I was going to cross the bar at their max speed a couple times to make sure I was all right with them uh, crossing. Want to drive for a minute? Uh, yeah. You right? We're arriving at the jetty tips, and it's very humbling. The seas are ginormous. It's breaking uh, 16 to 18 foot. Looking at a vessel like the fishing vessel Sylvia, we're thinking, oh my goodness, he better be on top of his game today. How are you, Rick? About a nine minute roll in between these larger series. So I kept her at six and a half all the way in. It was a little sloppy at the tip, and we didn't get picked up any. Yeah. Tell me when to go, and I'll punch it and follow you in. Hell yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's a Sylvia that that's we spirit. Yeah, Roger, we'll follow you in. If there's any breaks, we're going to take them. You guys won't take them. Thank you so much. All right, Sylvia's inbound. Uh, 10 foot 12, come on, you're Oh, Jesus. Here it comes. He's going to take on. it. Oh, so, holy crap. Hey, back, we back, just back, got back, knocked back. down. 70, 70 degree knockdown. I see the lifeboat as it comes around and just gets enveloped in a wall of white, and my my heart sank. Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. All right, Sylvia's inbound. Oh, Jesus. Here it comes. We received a call on the radio from the fishing vessel Sylvia, who was stuck out in the storm. He's gonna Hold take on. it. I, I see the lifeboat as it comes around and just gets enveloped in a wall of white, and my my heart sank. Uh, I didn't know what was gonna happen. Little reflection, you got two back. All right, Willie. Switching drivers. It's definitely scary seeing the victory disappear. It was nasty looking at white water and then not seeing the victory and then not seeing the Sylvia. And you have those moments of, you know, quietness on the radio. Victory 6A, are you guys okay, over? Watch the, watch the Sylvia, watch the Sylvia. Sylvia, Sylvia. Break on the quarter. Down the back side. Victory 6 we got good biz on the Sylvia. Uh, almost inside tips, just took a break on the quarter. Uh, got him a little squirrely. Good to your uh, still on track. Good on the jetty, looking good. One more break on the quarter. <laughs> tell, tell him, just tell him we can't understand what he's saying. Transmission came in over the radio really, really muffled. Uh, you can tell that the, the Victory had water in their microphone from the wave. Victory 6 eight, can't understand you, water in the mic over. But we did make out, we're okay, we're fine. So immediately, we get eyes on the fishing vessel, Sylvia, and we're watching them. Sylvia 6 eight, Victory, look like you got another series coming in on the buoy line, dumping grounds right now. We're comforting the Victory because the Victory does not know where they're at at the time, they know that what hit them is coming for the Sylvia next. Watch them, Asia. Hi. Sylvia 6-8, looks like you got another series coming in on the buoy lines right now. Sylvia, back We had just had a series roll through. That was a bigger series. And we told the Sylvia that it was a good time to go, that we should have about eight minutes. So they started in and probably the biggest series we saw all day came rolling underneath. It came a little early, and it was a little bigger. High side forward. Come on, come around. Right. 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 The victory squared up and, and took a good sized swell, and Sylvia then had probably a 14 to 16 foot break, if not maybe even a little bigger, just engulf it on the stern. Uh, somehow, it just hit perfectly on the stern of the boat, and the white water rushed down both sides 
of the boat and kept it going in a straight line. How that happened, I have no idea, but somehow they got through it. We're stationed in Corner Bay, 6 8. Fishing vessel Sylvia and Victory are inside tips. Over. It feels awesome, like, super, yeah. Oh, God. Thanks for the opera, guys. That was awesome. <laughs> The seas that we encounter out here in the Aquinnah Bay Bar, just something as simple as exiting the bar and coming back into the bar are very, very difficult at times. Even for us, the helmsman on the Sylvia had to have been on top of his game. Must have had uh, an immense amount of experience here on the Aquinnah Bay Bar in operating his vessel. And it speaks volumes for how the evolution went. Golly, they got hit hard. Uh, well, that makes the sunny a little more fun. It's always a great feeling once everyone's safely inside, because you know that your job's done. You know that you got the number one goal of everyone coming back safely was accomplished. And, uh, and then you can go and prepare for the next mission. I'm Matthew Nacken. My vessel's the fishing vessel, Sylvia. We were on our way in with about 20,000 pounds of hagfish on at the time. We knew that there was a storm offshore generating a big swell that was coming in. So for us, it was a matter of staying out there, enduring another 18 hours of inclement weather, or get in. The whole time you're driving in, you're watching, and you see it and feel it building, and you start getting a little nervous. If you're in a taller boat with a wheelhouse, you can sit up and you can actually time the sets and it gives you a little sense of when you can go and when you can't. And that was the primary reason we needed assistance from the Coast Guard because we're so low that you can't see. And so having them figure out the timing in between the sets of breakers was what allowed us to get in. With them there on site, you feel safe enough to make the crossing. You know that if things do go south, they're there ready to respond. Thanks, guys, Yukini Coast Guard. I've had my bacon saved by them a few times. <laughs> you got to respect the guys that come bail you out when things get heavy, you know? Always tipping my hat to these guys. They provide us with a sense of security. <laughs> 